Welcome from the studios of KPBS TV at San Diego State University. The International Training Center today brings us all together in this teleconference, joining Mexico, the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay, Brazil, Argentina, the United States of America, and the United Nations Commission on Trade and Development in Geneva, Switzerland. We would like to thank Globecast Communications, Telecomunicaciones de México, PanamSat, and BrazilSat for their satellite linkage services which make this all possible today. Welcome to our program on transforming conflict into a win-win opportunity, the key to successful international negotiation. This is the ninth video conference of the series Principles for World Class Performance. My name is Richard Page and I will be your moderator for today's program. I am a private attorney with the San Diego law firm of Page and Bush LLP practicing in the areas of business and international law. Today's program is composed of two presentation modules and two question and answer sessions. We look forward to your live participation. Transforming conflict into a win-win opportunity is important to all of us who are working in the area of international commerce and trade. Much has been written and said about the theory and practice of conflict management. But in the increasingly more familiar work scenarios of diversity of tasks, resources, and cultures we all face today, conflict must be transformed into a win-win situation for all as the only guarantee for enduring success. This is crucial in international negotiations involving business or government where good communication and trust are quite often difficult to achieve in the short term. Today's video conference will discuss the win-win approach as the most viable strategy for effective conflict management in government, business, and society as we head into the 21st century. The distinguished invited speakers will propose practical guidelines for implementation, adaptation, and learning in the process, illustrating importance, the importance of concepts such as communication, ethics, and esteem in international conflict management. It is a pleasure to introduce to you today's expert speakers, Dr. Sanford Ehrlich and Mr. Scott Dunahee. Dr. Ehrlich is Associate Professor of Management at San Diego State University and the new Executive Director of the University's Entrepreneurial Management Center. His areas of teaching and research include leadership and teamwork, the management of technology-based companies, entrepreneurship, and organization design. He has received an outstanding faculty award from the Mortar Board chapter at his university. From 1993 to 1994, Dr. Ehrlich served as Interim Chief Operating Officer at Procopio, Corey, Hargreaves and Savage, a corporate law firm where he managed a transition to a team-based organization. He also has extensive management, consulting and training experience in both the private and public sectors with organizations such as NEC Electronics Inc., Kelco, Citicorp, DHL Airways Inc., Emory Worldwide, and Stanford University. His research papers have appeared in Leadership Quarterly, Administrative Science Quarterly, Journal of Business Venturing, Organization Studies, and the Academy of Management Journal. Mr. Dunahee is a partner with the law firm of Wise and Shepherd LLP in Palo Alto, California. He has acted as counsel in numerous arbitrations involving patent licenses, sales of companies, securities, pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, computer technology, and software systems. Mr. Dunahee is a trained mediator and member of the panel of arbitrators of the American Arbitration Association, 
the Asia-Pacific Center for the Resolution of International Business Disputes, the World Intellectual Property Organization Arbitration Center, the U.S.-Mexico Conflict Resolution Center, and other dispute resolution organizations in the United States, Malaysia, China, South Korea, and Poland. He has a Bachelor of Arts from Stanford University, a Master of Arts from Johns Hopkins University, and a Juris Doctorate from Santa Clara University. He has authored numerous articles and chapters on international commercial negotiation and speaks often at international dispute resolution seminars held in the United States and abroad. Welcome, gentlemen. Let us begin with an introductory question. How does one employ win-win strategies against an adversary who is using win-lose strategies? Dr. Ehrlich? I think the short answer is that it's extremely difficult to employ a win-lose strategy when, excuse me, a win-win strategy when you face an opponent who continues to use win-lose strategies. So I would ask myself, is this a transaction in which I'm attempting to establish a long-term relationship with the person that I'm negotiating with? If that's the case, then I would be better to walk away from the negotiation than to continue to employ what I would regard as, as strategies that essentially won't work in strengthening the relationship in the long term. Mr. Dennehy? Well, Richard, I, I would question whether there really is such a thing as a win-lose strategy in the world environment in which we operate today. As the global village continues to shrink, one's reputation precedes one in the industry and with customers and clients. And if one is perceived as trying to employ a win-lose strategy, uh, one is going to have a very difficult time in the future in commercial relationships with other partners and potential partners around the world. Thank you for your comments. Let us begin with Module 1, in which Dr. Ehrlich will explain the elements and dimensions of using a win-win negotiating strategy. Welcome. It is certainly a pleasure to be a part of this international teleconference on negotiation. Through the use of telecommunications technology, we are increasingly brought closer together and more capable of global cooperation and collaboration. Yet, in spite of our capability to communicate in this manner, we still have much to learn about each other's negotiation styles and practices. My purpose is to familiarize you with strategies that can transform conflict into win-win opportunities for both sides of a negotiation. I hope to create a lively discussion at the conclusion so that we can explore the issues you are dealing with in international negotiations, especially those that have aroused conflict between the people involved in the negotiation process. I will use many examples to illustrate the concepts that I am discussing. Also, I have provided additional materials in your workbook's appendix that can highlight some of the national differences in negotiating approaches. During this presentation, I would like you to collaborate with me as I present this material by bringing your own examples to mind with all of the richness and reality that bring you closer to the issue under discussion, transforming conflict in international negotiations into win-win opportunities. One of the complexities of an international negotiation is isolating the substantive issues from the cultural context in which those issues surface. Nevertheless, that is exactly what needs to be done to successfully reduce conflicts and achieve negotiated agreements. The parties involved in the negotiation should come to some agreement about the nature of the issues being discussed even though they may substantially differ in their thoughts about these issues and the style with which they present them. Conflicts that arise in international negotiation can be sliced into two broad types. Conflicts over interests and conflicts over personality and cultural differences including differences in national and organizational culture. 
each form of conflict may be present and difficult to unravel from the other. However, each requires a somewhat different approach to transforming the conflict into a win-win agreement. Before discussing how you might better manage each form of conflict to obtain win-win agreements, I will pr provide a brief overview of my presentation. We will begin by discussing three key dimensions influencing conflicts over interests and present how each can be used to reduce conflict when properly managed. Then I will examine the role of cultural differences in the negotiation process. My talk is not intended to be a primer on negotiating with any particular national group, be it Japanese, Taiwanese, Brazilians, Mexicans, or Chileans. While I will present brief scenarios that illustrate cultural differences, it is my position that an international negotiator needs to learn general principles that permit them to enter and adapt to different situations. During the course of each negotiation, the negotiator must pay particular attention to the unique aspects of the culture that can only be learned by immersing oneself in a foreign experience. Also, of utmost importance is the need for negotiators to be observant of verbal, nonverbal, and artifactual clues that familiarize them with a particular country's culture. Remember to keep in mind that negotiation is the start, continuation, or end of a business relationship. The outcome of the negotiation will either strengthen or weaken the ability of the persons in the relationship to sustain stresses or conflict over future issues. If the outcome of a first negotiation is perceived as a loss for either partner, there may be resentment or anger that surfaces in the relationship and lessens the likelihood that the persons in the negotiation will desire to continue the business relationship. So as conflict surfaces during a negotiation, you must overtly emphasize your desire for a win-win outcome, one that will build the resilience of the relationship to future conflicts and reduce the chances that your international collaboration will fail. Otherwise, you might as well accept your walk-away alternative and end the negotiation. Another point worth making is that conflict can be transformed. If the will of the negotiators exists to achieve a win-win outcome, what is a win-win outcome? And why do I strongly argue that it is a preferred outcome for most negotiations? From my perspective, a win-win agreement represents a synergistic blending of the interests of each side to the negotiation, an agreement that creates an equitable distribution of the interests being negotiated. Further, as a result of achieving this win-win outcome, each person in the negotiation feels energized from this business relationship and leaves with the intent to meet the obligations of the agreements that were reached. In contrast, in win-lose or competitive negotiations, we seek to gain at the expense of our opponent. In the short term, we may achieve a lower price or better tax incentives. However, we have weakened the capability of the relationship to reach subsequent agreements. In each situation, the negotiating parties involved in the conflict bring a set of interests they are bargaining over. And to prepare successfully for negotiations, each negotiating team must identify and examine their interests to prepare for the negotiation. While the intent of the negotiation is to reach an agreement, alternative courses of action need to be generated if agreement is not possible. 
This alternative course of action is our walk-away alternative. We can choose to employ it at any time that we do not feel that we can reach a negotiated agreement. You may have heard this walk-away alternative popularly referred to as a BATNA, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Knowing your BATNA is crucial to help you develop a sense of confidence in the negotiation. It also helps provide you with greater leverage, especially if the other side in the negotiation perceives that you are willing to end the negotiation because you have identified a feasible alternative. So identify your BATNA before you enter a negotiation and keep it in mind as you move through the negotiation. Once you have discussed your BATNA among the team that will be involved in the negotiation, you can more fully proceed to consider what the other party might be willing to offer. Throughout the negotiation, your BATNA serves as a minimally acceptable alternative. If you cannot reach an agreement that exceeds your BATNA, you would be best advised to walk away from the negotiation. Once you have a BATNA in mind, you are free to negotiate from that position. Assuming that you understand what you need to achieve as a result of the negotiation and when to walk away from it. Now let's assume that you have identified your BATNA and are prepared to enter a negotiation. To anticipate likely sources of conflicts over interests, I will introduce a framework that can be used to assess three key dimensions driving the severity of conflict the divisibility of goods, the reversibility of decisions, and the extent to which principles, ideologies, or values are involved. These three dimensions also provide a pathway for reducing conflict and transforming it into a win-win situation if managed appropriately during the course of a negotiation. As I discuss each dimension, Imagine yourself in a prior negotiation or project yourself into a future negotiation and think about the various interests of the people from both sides of the negotiation. With each dimension, consider how it has influenced or will influence your negotiation. First, the dimension of divisibility refers to the ease with which the interests under negotiation can be divided among the sides to the negotiation. In the negotiation that you are thinking about, what were or are the interests that are being negotiated? Are they divisible? In other words, can they easily be divided among each side in the negotiation in a fair and equitable manner? Naturally, interests that involve money, physical assets and other material goods can be easily divided, though each side may differ on the way to divide these. Now consider the case of indivisible goods. Is it impossible to divide these goods? Or are there creative ways to allocate these goods to each side of the negotiation? For example, the choice of a manufacturing site for an American corporation locating in Chile is largely an indivisible decision. If two Chilean cities are competing for the site, the American company cannot necessarily pick both. However, it is possible for each city to benefit by potentially creating relationships with manufacturers who can be a source of supply to the plant located in the other city. In this manner, both Chilean cities benefit from the decision. You can also anticipate that goods that are indivisible are perceived to be very difficult to distribute to each party. Costs are not easily calculated, 
and the sides to the negotiation perceive the situation as a zero-sum game. If you get that good, I don't. These types of interests generate great amounts of conflict. You need to anticipate these challenges and try to locate the means to divide apparently indivisible goods. We'll return to more examples of strategies for dealing with indivisible goods in a moment. The second key dimension driving the severity of conflict between the parties is the reversibility of the decision. If the negotiators of either side perceive or know for a fact that the decision is irreversible, for example, tearing down a historical building to put up a new corporate headquarters, then it is going to be more difficult to achieve a negotiated agreement on this issue. Irreversible decisions generate more conflict than reversible decisions. As in the case of divisibility of goods, the sides to a negotiation seeking a win-win agreement must work toward producing reversibility in decisions. By doing so, each side to the negotiation is more comfortable pursuing a decision if it can be reversed. Of course, in the case of tearing down a historical building, the decision is irreversible. So these types of decisions generate much greater conflict until they are resolved. Finally, the third key dimension, the extent to which principles, ideologies, or symbols are involved, promotes the greatest severity of conflict and is most difficult to resolve. Principles are perceived as irreversible and indivisible. So when an interest is tied to a particular principle or ideology, conflict can become particularly severe. For example, if an American executive frequently uses words such as free enterprise or profit during a negotiation, a negotiator from a developing country that is socialist might become annoyed at the arrogance of the American capitalist. As another example, consider a case where an American manufacturer of juice products is being told by a Mexican distributor that their product's name is not suitable for the Latin American market. The name, packaging, and advertising of this product are woven into the company's culture. This juice product was responsible for the early growth of the company and still generates the majority share of revenues. To reject the name of this product is to reject the company. If the Mexican company wishes to open distribution channels in Latin America, it will need to move Americans away from feeling offended by requests to alter the product's name. The Mexican principals perceive that their company brings marketing and advertising expertise and are confused as to why the Americans are so offended by their suggestion to change the product's name. In any case, the partners in this potential strategic alliance are in conflict and the resolution will need to take into account the needs of both partners to succeed. Are we at a standstill in the negotiation? I think not. One of the first strategies to consider when dealing with goods that are indivisible or situations that are irreversible is to identify multiple issues and options to address each. When we negotiate by taking each issue one at a time, we invite a situation where one side or the other might offer a take it or leave it approach. However, when multiple issues are considered simultaneously, it is much easier to link movement on issue A with movement on issues B, C, and D. 
In this manner, the lack of divisibility in one interest might be overcome by providing divisibility in several other interests or issues. So while the juice product we described has a name that is indivisible, the Americans might be more willing to consider a product name change if the costs associated with conducting the market research to do so are paid by both sides to the negotiation. Also, while this decision may seem irreversible, it can become reversible by agree agreeing to limited test marketing after which a final decision will be made. If either side in the negotiation begins to take a hard line position, the deal will not be completed. However, if both sides work toward a win-win outcome, they will seek creative ways to provide divisibility and reversibility. If principles become involved, each side should diligently work to move the negotiation away from these types of discussions and get back to the substance of particular issues. In general, negotiators seeking win-win agreements need to find divisibility.